Jim Frain here, so that I was asked to begin. <laughs> You've met me yesterday, and this session will be uh, done by me and Jana Venslikova from the Czech Republic. My first discussion will be in English, and the next one Jana will give, uh, hold on, using your first name, <laughs> in Czech. So please have those who need it like me, have your translators ready. Before I begin this session, I would like to comment on the previous session, actually, because one of the things that we didn't talk about enough, and only staff sharer was, I think, the advocate of it, was the point of the role of the community in the, in the state of the affairs in medical cannabis. And we believe that the community, especially the patient communi community, should unite and be a, a voice that should be heard within this context. That's why, actually, I'm very, I was very happy to hear that even now in the next room, Downstairs, there's a, com a committee being made of 11, sta 11 uh, states, uh, different 11 different countries, are trying to unite all of the patient uh, forums together in order to pass between them, to pass them knowledge, experience. And unfortunately, or fortunately, at this point of time, it's relevant what a patient says. If he says that for his disease, uh, a certain cannabis strain of such and such strains of THC and CBD was effective. It's a knowledge and a data that even us doctors we would like to know. Because as I will show further along my presentation, we don't exactly know what strain or what strength to use. Okay, they should also be eligible to comment on where do they believe the studies should go. If they are big enough, they may be even be able to fund some of the research that has to be done in this area because as we know pharmaceutical companies don't do a lot of research especially only on those which they can have a patent and the governments for obvious reasons do not give a lot of money uh, for research as far as I know. So that's just my comments concerning the community. What we will be doing now, actually, is a, is a workshop that I need your help, okay? How many, of you, how many of you here are doctors or nurses? Fine, thank you. Quite a few, so I would really need your help because what we are going to discuss is what are we going to do with patients. So first of all, when do we start cannabis? What is the first question that we have to ask ourselves? I believe that the first question we have to ask of us is what is the diagnosis? And is it current with, indication, with the current indications of cannabis? We have to know. What do you think? Who, are, who put his hand up before? Any of the doctors? Would anyone like to comment which diagnosis? How many of you had already prescribed cannabis? Only one? Two. Okay. How do, how do you decide on which patient to start? Can you elaborate? No. Well, I've been working in the field of cancer palliative care, so the majority of my patients are the, the, the advanced cancer patients who has the, sometimes the pain which is not uh, sufficiently managed by opioids or, or standards analgesics. So these are for me the candidates for, uh, for consideration of uh, cannabis. Thank you very much. So that's exactly, usually on pain, especially cancer-reduced can, uh, cancer pain, which is uh, now especially on a deathbed, it's very obvious, and there's a lot of already evidence-based evidence medicine that says that we should start. But you at least must know whether you're working on an evidence-based medicine or a shot in the dark. I'm not saying sometimes we got to the point that we don't know exactly what to do, and it's a shot of the dark, in the dark. And it's fine as long as we know it and we tell the patient that. Okay, because when, even when you start a specific uh, medication without exactly the knowledge of what's happening, for instance, in fibromyalgia, when it doesn't respond to Excel or, or Duloxetine or Lurica, and then we start other SSRIs and not SNRIs, we tell him it's a, shot of the it's a shot in the dark. Okay, so the same I expect with cannabis. And then, of course, you also expect the results or put hope for the... For the future for the patient. The next question you have to answer before starting cannabis is whether it's for this specific diagnosis, did you do not all proved treatments, but at least the best ones? I'm not expecting you, for instance, if you treat depression, 
with cannabis, I'm not expecting you to try all SSRIs, all SNRIs, all treat cyclic, all treat cyclic, but I do expect you to try at least one of each group. And of course, with sufficient, with appropriate dose and sufficient length of time. Because if the patient took two days duloxetine, of course he won't respond. We know that for to, res to respond for duloxetine, it takes at least eight days, usually something around two to three weeks. And uh, our advice is usually to, to continue on an appropriate dose for at least six weeks before deci deciding failure of treatment. So it takes a long time uh, to start cannabis. Of course, the next question which you should ask is there a contraindication? The contraindication would be what, for instance? Can anyone tell me? Heart condition. Heart condition. Of course, we talked about it. Uh, cannabis causes tachycardia. In congestive heart failure, it may be lethal. And you should at least consider it. I'm not saying it's a complete uh, contraindication, but it's a part contraindication. Yes, did you want to say something? Pregnancy is again a consideration. You all the time, I think in one of the movies, the doctor said measure. But usually you, do, you we prefer not to give cannabis to uh, pregnant women because we'll talk about it a bit later because it has uh, uh, things on, to, on the fetus. It has a, did you want to say Ethan? Well, I was just going to mention schizophrenia. Exactly. That's of course the main contraindication, schizophrenia or prior psychotic attacks. Now again, it's a relevant contraindication, I would say even a, a, a what you call a full, <laughs> full contraindication, but we do have somewhat like 40 schizophrenic patients that have unfortunately cancer because although there's some, some data that schizophrenia, schizophrenic patients have less cancer, but they do have cancer and advanced cancer death, and we thought they should receive cannabis, but then we made a pact with them they are moving on long-term uh, long medication, which means they come every two weeks to the hospital. In Israel, it's co very convenient. One of the main uh, dispensary is located within a psychiatric hospital. So they come to the hospital, they get a long-term injection, a long-acting, sorry, injection, usually of risperidol, con ris risperidol contra, and, uh, which is relevant for two weeks. And each two weeks, they get the allowance, the cannabis allowance for the next two weeks. So we also uh, sort of uh, procure the, the adherence to the psychiatric therapy. I must say that within those 40 patients, we didn't have any psychotic attacks during the time, and some of them are already under four years of cannabis treatment. Last but not least, what is and how is the therapeutic alliance between the doctor and patient? I think Dr. Resnick in his previous presentation talked about it, how important it is. I usually do not give cannabis on the first meeting. I do this because unfortunately some of my friends, psychiatrists, do not, uh, rec do not want to recommend cannabis for PTSD and usually they send them to me, or not usually, but a lot of them send them to me but then I demand a letter from the psychiatric who is treating the patient up to now. What happened? What did he try? For how long? And all the things we talked about. And only then am I willing to see the patient for the first time. And even then I'm telling him in advance, usually on the phone, that I do not, uh, I, I cannot guarantee that I will give him cannabis. Okay, only if I will check, I will give him cannabis. And you must understand that well, if I am, going to give him cannabis, then I want to make sure that the other comes to me for checkup or to his previous psychiatrist. Usually we talk about before three of us, the doctor, the, psych the referring psychiatrist and me. And he must understand, and I'll talk again about it, that in the beginning I would like to hear from him, not necessarily a visit, it can be a telephone call, but at least once a week. Usually the side effects that happen usually happen within the first few days or the first few weeks. When the therapy is stabilized, usually you don't have any more side effects. So when the next part is how to start. You have to discuss the, th the mode of therapy. Why do you have to discuss it? Why, is it? why can't you just tell the patient, I want you to smoke, a to smoke a cigarette? Because some of them don't want to smoke. 
If you were talking about cookies, some of them prefer not to have cookies at home because they have small children. Okay? Um, there are various reasons some of them will tell you they've got a very a problem in the throat with no connection to the uh, disease they're having a therapy with so they cannot smoke or um, vaporize. So you have to discuss it with them and some will, have, will, have, will tell you their preference which is fine and okay too. You must discuss the prohibition of driving while under the influence. I'm not going to debate the debate that we talked on uh, on previous sessions, how long, whether six hours or three weeks or, or one hour, but you must tell them the driving is impaired while under the influence, especially when beginning treatment. But I think most of you that when you give medication, whether it's a, a benzodiazepine like Valium or antipsychotic like Perfenan or Risperidol or Olanzapine, I'm sorry I'm taking it usually from my psychiatric uh, work, I also tell them beware of driving because our psychiatric uh, medication is usually very sedative. And at least in the beginning, I don't want any one of them falling asleep while driving. Okay, I usually am um, a bit cynical and I say, me, I, I don't really care now. I wouldn't say that. But uh, I mean, it's not only that you be, might be hurt, you might hurt other people and suffer the guilt for that. The same goes with operating heavy machinery or precision work because we know that cannabis interferes with what we call uh, the eye-hand uh, relationship or I don't know how to say it exactly in English. Coordination, coordination yeah. The, the eye and the hand coordination. We talked a lot about start low and go slow. And what I'm saying now is what we do in Israel, okay? It's not... It can, it, yeah, I know that it changes from country to country. I, I talked with Ramon Azenkap uh, in the, in this morning. It's different, for instance, in Holland or in, in the Netherlands, and it can change from country to country. What I'm telling you now is the Israeli experience, and you can decide whether you want to implement this or any other. But when we start, we start about 0 0.66 grams a day. Usually, as I, as I said, uh, we start the most common way in Israel is unfortunately smoking because the most convenient, you can go with a cigarette to the work even if you're not allowed by law. You can't take the vaporizer as you saw and you can't go away, you can't walk in the street with the balloon that you saw in the, uh, in the volcano. So usually people prefer cigarettes. And we start with 0 0.66 a day, usually divided in at least two doses. Now when we say two doses, it doesn't have to mean two, cig two cigarettes. Yelena in her presentation talked about you can take two puffs and if it's only a, a pure cannabis cigarette, it will go off, off by itself. It wouldn't continue to burn. And then you can start at the evening to take a few more puffs from the same cigarette. Maybe the taste is not as good as it should be, but it's a medication. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to taste nice. Okay? <clears throat> Instruction is mandatory in Israel, at least for the first time. And when I'm talking about instruction, it means that he has to know who his instructor is. He usually goes, he, has, he sits with them for at least an hour. Whether they try to get the dose together or not, it depends where he does it. If he does it, for instance, in my former hospital in Norbal Banel, he's not allowed to smoke or use cannabis on the premises for obvious reasons. It's a psychiatric hospital. If the instructor comes for more pay, uh, comes to his house, he can use the amount that he already received and instruct him on the cannabis itself. Okay, but what we demand of the instructor is to be available 24 hours a day by phone for the next two weeks. And again, this is very, very important because in the as I said, most side effects are in the first, first days. Okay? Usually two weeks is sufficient. Okay, and if it has an anxiety attack or a dizziness, like that, which can be treated very easily. Okay, and we will talk about it later. Follow-up is again essential, at least once a week for the first month. And then I know there's a debate going on how long or after how long a period should the next visit be. In Israel, again, when I was a regulator, we decided at least once in three months, I want this patient to see a doctor. We do not give, like in Germany, a permit for life. 
The permit is also for only uh, extended each, has to be extended each year. And usually it's for the, the beginning, it, you give the permit for half a, half a year, and only when you get to a steady state, it becomes a one year uh, permit, and then you have to renew it every one year. This is to make assurance that the patient sees the doctor at least once a year, hopefully four times a year. Now, I think I do not give any medications. Again, if we go to my, uh, my psychiatric profession, when I give uh, antidepressant, even in a steady state, I want him to see at least the family doctor once in three months. In Israel, each time you have to uh, fulfill a prescription, uh, what we call a chronic prescription, like uh, treating blood pressure or insulin for diabetes, you have to do it at least in one, once in three months, which means you have to contact your doctor, and the doctor will know approximately what's happening. Okay? Again, it can be done by phone. It doesn't have to be a physical visit if it's, if it's a long way from home, as they say. But it has to be at least a once in a few months to see what's happening with the patient. Increasing dose, we believe that the dose increment should be in 10 grams each, only once a month, because as we said, we start low and go slow, which means it's about 0 0.33 grams a day. Okay? I can't argue exactly why we wait a month Part of it is due to bureaucratic reasons because each permit has to be renewed and if you can't do it in less than a month, that's why actually we did it in a month time. But I think again, you should wait at least one week and two to two weeks before allowing an increase in the dose. Sorry, of course, before increase of dose, you want to see some success in treatment. I would not go above one gram a day with not at least a partial success. Okay, because if it, do, if it doesn't have any effect, or if it has, of course, a disastrous effect, will stop. But if it doesn't have any, some beneficial effect, I would not go above one gram, and usually I would stop it after one or two months if I don't see the desired effect. The decision of strains. What we say here is nothing concrete and nothing that I can put hard data on. We are working mainly with uh, three to six I would say I call it strains. We call it the high THC, low CBD, medium THC, medium CBD, low THC, high CBD, and we have each one either from the sativa or from the indica. That's why we have six and not three. Okay, sativa is considered to be more excitatory. The indica is considered to be more sedative, and you sort of work with it what, on what you need or for the patient or what the patient prefers. Okay, most of the prescriptions that we give are sativa, and, but you don't have to write, uh, in, the, in the permit that you request, you don't have to write the strain. You have to just to write the strength, but not, you don't have to write the strain. Usually, if you do not write a strain, the patient will receive a sativa. When I say that high TC is mostly for neuropathic pain or MS, again, we believe so. There is some evidence to the point. I cannot say it's evidence-based medicine. Okay, a lot of patients will respond to other variations in the treatment, but this is, we have, well, since we prescribe, we have to work according to some guidelines, or not have to work, but at least you know there are some guidelines uh, that we think at this point are true, but as I said, they will probably change in the next few years. Treating known side effects. As I said, this is, will be the main work of the instructor, not of you. But when you prescribe cannabis, in the beginning you have to warn the patient or tell the patient, I don't know if it's a specifically or warning because we are talking about now the minor side effects, that there are side effects that can be treated. So for instance, a dry mouth, we should use a chewing gum or a candy, non-sugar, because otherwise they will get uh, holes in their teeth, okay? so. Uh, I'm sorry for the okay all the time. I know it's my <laughs> problem. Dry or red eyes, you can use uh, eye drops if it's, if it's needed. Some of the patients do not like to come to work with the red eye, which it seems everybody they feel that everybody will know they're using cannabis or at least tired and will ask them how they are. So they prefer to take eye drops uh, in case of dryness or red eyes. Nausea and vomiting can happen even though cannabis is being used to treat nausea and, vom and vomiting, especially in, 
<coughs> in um, chemotherapic agents, it can cause by itself nosine vomiting. If it's a once, usually the beginning of treatment, once uh, a one-time episode, you can treat it with sweet drinks, usually Coke, but I'm not allowed to do any advertisement, so you can use just, I don't know, strawberry, <laughs> or whatever sweet drinks, or tea with at least three spoons of sugar. Of sugar. Um, if the, the, if the, um, uh, the vomiting especially, um, <coughs> if it continues, if it persists, you should remember that there is an hyperamesis situation or syndrome caused by cannabis. Very rare, that's true. But there is that. I saw one patient. And of course, if that's the case, you have to stop the cannabis. When they have tachycardia, um, at least in the beginning, you just lower the dose. Which means if you started in with a 0 0.66, you can go down to a 0 0.33, divide it to two doses. You don't have to stay uh, on, the full on the full dose. And then after a few days, uh, elevate the dose back to a 0 0.66. Lung problems, of course, is just to avoid smoking. Impaired mental function. Now, I'm not talking about psychiatric side effects. People will tell you they are less able to, some of them take it for ADHD reasons and tell that they can concentrate much better while using cannabis. A lot of the PA patients will tell you that they, they feel the sedation and they feel the slowing down of the cognitive abilities. And remember what we talked about before, that those patients want to go back to work or go back to college or university or usually not school because are, as I said, we prefer not to give it to younger patients, but they feel a cognitive slowdown. And again, if it's a problem, you can recommend lowering the dose or at least lowering the daytime dose. Like that actually nighttime, if you are sedated, it's not exactly, a, might not be a, that big of a problem. Let's put it that way. Again, if, you if they feel dizzy, sweet drinks can elevate the dizziness. Mainly calm them down. A lot of the patients need to be talked with. That's why we want the instructor to be available for, the for 24 hours for the first two weeks so they can call in if there's a problem. And usually just talking to them would elevate the dizziness and will elevate, uh, sorry, and will elevate the anxiety. When there's a severe psychiatric problem, of course, you have to stop the cannabis. Again, you may debate later whether you're going to restart it. We, out of the uh, 16, when we had 16,000 patients, I don't know what is happening exactly today, we had about 30 patients who developed psychosis when starting cannabis treatment. Okay, so for the reference, I'm not sure it's due to cannabis, but they did have a cannabis, they did have a psychosis while on cannabis. 12 of them continued to a full schizophrenia. Most of them stopped cannabis. Uh, sorry, all of them stopped, well, the cannabis was stopped for a period of time. Some of them came back after they were non-psychotic, saying that they cannot live because of the pain due to the cannabis. So again, we put them on a mixed regimen of antipsychotics and cannabis. Okay, my own patient is on olanzapine and cannabis already for five years with no, he did, doesn't, didn't have a follow-up psychotic episode up to now. Uh, again, on sedation specific, you just lower the dose. Precautions. First of all, of course, is pregnancy. As far as we know, patients, actually we don't have enough, our main problem is that we don't have enough data from uh, the patients. And most patients, women patients, prefer not to smoke at all and not to use cannabis during pregnancy, because when you tell them that it might affect the embryo, might affect the, the fetus, and of course might affect due to that the baby, they prefer not to. And true, it's very hard on any medication to do a clinical trial on pregnant women. I mean, how, what do you tell? If you take 40 pregnant women, tell them, 20 I will give you a placebo, 20 I'll give you and see what happens to the baby. <laughs> I'm not sure you'll get an informed consent. Okay, so it's a problem. But uh, we prefer not to use cannabis in a pregnancy if it's a, if it's a 
if we can avoid it, and if we do have data that affects the baby, usually preterm birth and small weight, low birth weight, what's called. Breastfeeding cannabis or part of the cannabis can pass in the milk. <coughs> um, whether it's problematic or not depends, but of course, as since we don't know, we use the primum non nocere proverb, which means first of all, cause no harm. So we advocate against using cannabis while, while breastfeeding. How did this we talked about? The last thing that I would like to talk about concerning precautions is drug to drug interactions. Remember, cannabis is a medication, not a, maybe not a, a legalized medication, but it's a medication that works, that is degraded at least partly by the liver using what we call the, the 450 cytochrome, which means that it um, works with, it, it puts on the liver a load which um, goes on other drugs. And if you're using antabuse, for instance, you will have a higher amount of antabuse, a smaller amount of fluoxetine, so you have to remember it. Warfarin, since it's also degraded by the liver, will go up, which means uh, if you get it for an anti-clotting uh, preparation, uh, that's the, the, the reason of getting warfarin, and the, what we call the INR goes up, the patient might start bleeding, and you have to remember that. So you have to check the INR at least much more, uh, more times, at least in the beginning of treatment of cannabis, until you get, reach a steady state, or lower the warfarin in advance, and then check the INR, and start elevating the, I, the warfarin, according to the INR measurement. Also, uh, cannabis, I don't know if it's beneficial for diabetic patients, but it does lower sugar concentration in the blood, what we call the glucose concentration in the blood. And you must remember it, especially in diabetic people who are under treatment, whether in insulin or whether in glucophage, uh, metformin, which is another, dr uh, another diabetic drugs, and I don't know all the diabetic drugs, but you, may ha you must make sure that you have your full anamnesis of the patient and what, more, what other drugs he's taking, what other concomitant drugs he's taking, and what other um, diseases he's having besides those or that that is being treated very specifically with the cannabis. According at least to the statistic, if you treat older age people, people over 65 have usually at least two diagnoses concomitant to diagnosis already. Over 75, they would usually have over at least three concomitant diagnoses already. So even if it comes for a pain, for, uh, due, to, due to chronic pain, you might have uh, high blood pressure, you might have a diabetes, migraine, or any other concomitant disease. Success of treatment. This is extremely important and we tend to forget. We have to discuss the success measures with the patient beforehand and even to make a table of what, we are, what will be the success in what, how do we measure success? Hopefully, we'll use proven reliable scales, usually pain scales that can be that we have already, or other scales. If you're talking Crohn's, if it was a severe patient, was hospitalized, let's say, four times in the last three months, then lowering the rate of hospitalization can be a measure of success. If it's other things, you should see, always remember that cannabis has an abuse potential the measures itself, we would prefer to be objective, which means not only the patient says he's feeling better, because due to the abuse potential and the addictive potential of cannabis, a 9%, at least according to other studies, not within patients, 9% of the population who use cannabis will become addicted. Okay, so it might be the same case in our patients, and we must remember it, so we have to use objective measures, not only subjective, which can be return to work and discussion uh, with the spouse uh, on how he sees or she sees the patient uh, achievements during the th this cannabis treatment. Uh, the dosing of, we already said about, about, the, uh, about how we start the dosage and the start low and go slow, and, but I would like to mention that Usually, we try to stop at one gram a day. When we reach two grams, we are starting to be, to discuss at least with the patient the possible 
possible consequences of addiction. And we want to make sure that all the cannabis goes to him or her. Okay? Most of the patients, if you have a good therapeutic relationship, will tell you, actually, I'm, I'm using less, but I'm giving my spouse some because she also has chronic pain and did not get a permit or uh, other things like that. Especially when, you, when we work with old age people, which usually both of them have problems. Some, one of them got the permit, the other didn't get the permit, and they're trying to get. Also in Israel, it's due to um, monetary costs because if you can get, since you pay only once a month, if you can get a 30 gram allowance and use 20 and give 20, 10 to his spouse, they don't have to pay twice. Okay, so you must remember this and at least discuss it. What you do with it, with the information is again, according to your own ethics, and I can't, have a, I can't say I have a, an answer, but at least you should know how much the patient is getting. We do not give above 100 grams a day we have some formal patients because to tell the truth, when we started the program or when I started the program, we thought that 200 grams a day uh, would be the probable um, maximum dose. We discovered that we sort of, uh, how should I say it uh, mildly, overdosed our patient. And we went down slowly to 100 grams. Most of the people do not go, as I said, above 30. And the average dose in Israel is already constant for at least three years is 34 point something. <coughs> when to stop? When to stop is a question, okay? How much, I mean, the reason I think in Germany you give a prescription for life and maybe you can elaborate <laughs> is probably because we're talking about chronic diseases which you do not believe will get better with time. If so, if your expectation actually that they will get worse. So you th think that a patient who started cannabis, let's say at the age of 40, will continue it hopefully <laughs> up to the age of 80 and, and more. But you must check, okay? Because if there's a neurological disease of some kind, eventually it might pass or be better with time, whether because of the death of the neuron that causes the trouble or not. So you can lower the dose or even stop cannabis. If serious side effects sometimes appear with life because of dementia, because of other problems, because the, the patient who was beside a specific disease was healthy at the time, let's say he had a lumbosacral uh, discopathy and for that reason a, pain, a chronic pain and he got the cannabis at the age of 30, maybe at the age of 60, he already has a heart problem and you have to rediscuss and reopen the, the, the consideration of your cannabis treatment. Lack of efficacy with time. Some of our patients, there's a lack of efficacy with time, like with a lot of medications. At the beginning, it's very efficient. And within, hopefully, years and not months, it becomes less efficient. And you have to change. You usually try to change its strain or a bit, a bit elevated dose, but sometimes it stops working and you have to stop it. Violent behavior, especially in the elderly, if it is apparent within the cost context of, of cannabis treatment, not because you decided to treat cannabis, to use cannabis to treat violent uh, uh, behavior, especially in dementic patient, but during the cannabis treatment, suddenly the, the patient became violent. It's also a good consideration, to cons it's a good, behavior, good measure to consider stopping the cannabis because it can cause, again, seldom, but it can cause violent behavior. And if you decide there's a lack of medical need, I think we talked about it already. Last but not least, as again, I will, tell, I will uh, ask you to remember the bell shape, which means not always uh, more is beneficial, and sometimes less is more. And you have to remember it. that's the reason why we don't go above 100 grams. And I'm sure some of the people in the audience will tell me that even that is much too much. Those are the curves. It's not exactly the bell curve, but... Um, you see a full agonist. This is the maximum capacity of the receptors. Usually when they are above 50% uh, of the receptor are captured, we say it's already uh, reached the, the topmost uh, level. As you see, a full agonist, the HU2010, will, will um, nearly have 100% capacity of the receptors. The THC, which is a partial agonist, actually, will, have, will reach the maximum level. Uh, of 50% of occupancy. 
and CBD, which is an inverse agonist, if you know the term, will have exactly sort of the opposite response, or what we call the mirror response. But again, I showed a bell curve uh, yesterday, but as you see, at least they reach a maximum amount, which above that, hiring the dose will not reach any more beneficial uh, aspects. So there's no point going above a specific dose. You won't get more, you will just get the side effects. And some of the side effects are those related. Um, since we do have time, I would like to talk about the regulations a bit, unless you have some questions at present. Please, Mr. Baruch, um, my name is Peter Mucha. I'm from uh, a patient organization, COPAT, and I want to ask about the contraindication or uh, the regulation because of age, like uh, kids and elderly people. Thank you. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, age, thank you very much for the question. Age, at least in Israel, is a partial contraindication. As I said, we know that the uh, endocannabinoid um, system maturates somewhere in the mid-20s. And we believe that using cannabis, whether for recreational reasons or medical reasons, might interfere with the uh, normal building or normal, uh, of the, or normal evolution of the endocannabinoid system. So we recommend not to use cannabis even for medical reasons, before the, the age of 30. But, of course, again, it's something you have to consider. If you have a... We had a baby of two years with leukemia, who suffered from pain, and we decided to treat her with cannabis, and she responded very well. So I'm saying, okay, I'll... If she will... First of all, I wanted to leave till the age of 20, and then if there will be a problem with the endocannabinoid system, we'll probably work it out, I'll work it out somehow. But if it's only for, I don't know, a migraine once a month in a kid of 16, I would not advise using cannabis as a treatment. Okay? There's also what we didn't, call a, what we didn't discuss at all is a, a motivational syndrome. A motivational syndrome usually appears after 20 years or, or so of daily use, but we have, only, we have this data only from recreational users. We don't know exactly what is happening with patients because even in Israel, um, the, the, the system is only about uh, 12 years of age, so we don't have enough data concerning patients using it for that much of the time. But again, if there is a, a motivational syndrome, it would be a problem if you started treating the patient within the age of 30, and when he reaches 50, he becomes suffering from an unmotivational syndrome. I am less um, occupied if I'm starting the, pa the, the treatment in a patient of 80 years old, whether will he reach 100, he will be suffering from our motivational syndrome. Uh, okay. Any more questions? I'm going there. Please. Uh, my name is Geronimo from Spain. Uh, what, is, what is your position, the medical position, the people that you are investigating with, with cannabis? Because you haven't said it about these high concentrated extracts that, that recre recreational users are, are using. I don't understand the, the, the question. I ask, are you asking whether I'm pro or against recreational use? No, 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 no. Is, do you see value on these high con highly concentrated products? The point of highly, co the point, um, and again, I talked with Hanno Azenkap this morning about it. It's not the point. Uh, it's the point of how much THC and CBD enters the body. So okay, if I think that, for instance, you should get a 15 milligram uh, of THC, I can use a high construct and give him uh, not a lower dose, but a less quantity. I can use a smaller uh, intensity and give him a higher quantity. The, the end, I want to know how many, how, how much a THC at least entered his body, okay? I don't know exactly because I know there's a problem with the bioavailability and what all we talked all those three days. But it's not a point of using high, uh, high extract or low extract. It's a point how much we use. Any more questions? I'm an internist and I wanted to ask you a lot. Hodně kardiaků, kteří jsou na beta blokátorech. 
mají chronické bolesti z nejrůznějších důvodů. Je možné jim doporučit konopí a přitom zvednout ty betablokátory. The question was concerning the uh, concomitant use of beta blockers in hard conditions and, uh, and cannabis. Again, that depends. Yeah. It's a possibility, but I would do it with the cardiologist. Okay, I wouldn't do it as, I'm a psychiatrist by profession. So when a pe people are talking about mental side effects or mental problems, I feel quite competent in deciding by myself. When they have another disease that are getting treated for, I usually ask, permission from them to contact the specialist, the cardiologist or the enterologist, and then discuss with him the option of treating cannabis and what does it, does it imply on, on what he's treating. Again, we must remember, and I'm, I hope I'm not saying a profound word, I said it before, we are treating holistic, we are treating the patient, we are not treating a, a, the disease. Okay, so we must remember the patient may, may be suffering from some other disease and we have to consider it and work with accordance with all the, all the medical team. And unfortunately, we are now in the age of chronic diseases and medical, medical, medical teams is a necessity, which is another lecture ball together. Any more questions? Uh, Natasha Payne, Specialist Czech Republic. I would like to ask you if you ask your patient uh, to sign informed consent prior setting up the treatment. In Israel, it's mandatory to, uh, s to sign them on informed consent that they know that cannabis is not an advocate or, how should I say, an advocated treatment and that we do not have enough knowledge concerning the lungs, um, the late side effects. And also that in Israel specifically, because of the law, that they, know, that they should know that according to the law, as far, all the time they are treated, being treated with cannabis, they're not allowed to drive. Okay, but that's a specific regulation in Israel. We are trying to change it, but, and the parliament has already, the Israeli parliament, the Knesset has already agreed uh, to change it and to make a difference between recreational use, which will state that you're not allowed to, to drive as long as you have derivatives in the urine, uh, but they will consider that, uh, for, that for medical patients, they will not be allowed to drive only if they have more than five nanograms per milliliter in their blood. And the recommendation has been said to the Knesset, but as you know, in our political situation, the Knesset changes every two years, so it doesn't have the time to change it. Any more questions? So I would like to f finish by talking a bit about the re essence of regulation, and, doesn't, and it's really the essence. It will be different between each, city, between each state or each country, but this is the essence. The regulation should be as thin as possible. Okay, if it's too much regulation, too much clerk, too much bureaucracy, you see that the, that, the, that the doctors do not want to advocate it, and sometimes the patients even give up. And Israeli, we are on the verge of, because you have to do it, you have to fulfill the, um, the recommendation by using a computerized system, which is fine, but you can't send it through the computer. You have to print it and then sign it and then send it by fax and then contact uh, the unit to make sure that it got there. A lot of bureaucracy and it's, and it's becoming a problem. Okay, the, um, the, the growers, at least at the UN Convention, I think it's true and I, we talked about it, should not be allowed to have direct contact with the patients. Because of course, even if they're really sincere and honest, they want to push their own merchandise. And if the patient doesn't, doesn't uh, go along or, isn't, or what he's being treated with a specific strain of theirs is not sufficient, they will ask him to move to another strain of theirs, to ask for an increase in regiment of theirs. They would not send him to uh, his colleagues or his uh, um, or other, other people in the industry and make him leave their own uh, <coughs> company. Packaging label and storage, at least in Israel, it's still a problem. We want the packages to be the safe and we want to be that everything would be labeled at least with the percentage of THC and CBD. As what I was asked before, it's essential because what we want to know eventually, or 
in the end of when we when we give a, a recommendation is at least how much entered let's say the mouth of the patient whether by smoking or whether by any other uh, means whether it's a 15 milligram of THC or not as I said in my previous uh, uh, statement which means I have to know the strength and only then I can tell him how much to smoke or how much to take from the oil he needs to know and I need to know I need as a doctor Accessibility at home and hospital. Remember, those are patients. Some of them get hospitalized. MS patients, cancer patients. They have to be able to continue the medication within the hospital. Okay? In, at least in Israeli hospital, it was decided that smoking will be banned. They can use either a vaporizer or an oil, uh, or an oil um, preparat. And... So it, if it's someone who we know that he will be hospitalized often, we recommend that he will start already with vaporizing and oil or oil so he won't have to change. But if not, we tell him that if you'll be hospitalized and you will have to continue the cannabis, you will have to change your mode of intake. Uh, is the access computerized system is essential. As I said before, if you put too much of a burden on a doctor bureaucratically, he wouldn't, he wouldn't start with it. He wouldn't prescribe cannabis just because he doesn't have the time. I don't know how long do you have in, with the patient. Unfortunately, in the Israeli medical system, under what we call the sick funds, the kupot cholim, the family physician has approximately seven minutes period for every patient. Okay, if you're a specialist, you have 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, it's not enough. It's not enough. And as I said, in Israel, you have to print, you have to sign, you have to send. It, it's not enough. Okay, so if it's not easy accessible. And then also from the regulator point of view, I as a regulator want to know all the data. I want to know who prescribes, how much, how many patients does he have. Okay, but not only for, how do you know, to, to, to ask him and then, I don't know, yell at him that he's not doing what I want. I want to know. I, if I as a regulator, according to UN convention, has to, have to tell the growers what I foresee the future harvest will be, I need to know how many are using what. Or remember, to uh, destroy the access material is a problem. And I don't want to have too much access material. I would also want to know the data. Eventually, I would like to know that in the Czech Republic, and I think Jana and me talked about it quite a lot, five years from now, she can say that, I don't know, uh, out of the 5,000 patients who have been treated for neuropathic pain, uh, ten of them were treated by, I know only the Israeli names of the strains, by Erez, uh, 4,000 by Avi Dekel, and 20% by WD-40, and, and what happened to them? So then I would know that a certain strain would be more beneficial to begin treatment of a certain disease. This data I will only know if I can comply it with the com easy access computerized system. Uh, professional training for physician, patients, and family member. Uh, my colleague already talked about the need for doctors, uh, for doctors to, to, to train. Actually, in Israel, in at least two of the four medical uh, schools, there is at least a day that the five-year student or the six-year student uh, come to what used to be my hospital and we discuss the therapy of cannabis one full day. I'm not saying if it's enough, but I think it's enough for a student. Okay, remember it's a five-year student. Uh, they, usually in Israel it's a six-year course to become a doctor. You have also to train the patient, as I said, by the instructor, and you have to train the family. Usually they need to help the, 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 the patient, depends how debilitating he is. Uh, debilitated, sorry. And sometimes you have to work with the stigma, as you saw with the, the pure movie, when you saw the son of the cancer patient that had a stigma against use of cannabis. Um, of course, striving to include cannabis in the health basket, even in Israel, $100, when the lowest uh, pay is about $1,000, it's a burden on a patient. And remember that those are patients, which means they usually, as I said before, go slide down the socioeconomic levels. And for them, paying for a for a commitment is costly, even if it's only $100, if it's much less than the, the black market and all of the things, it's still costly. Last and not, and not least, R&D 
an international working story about the mistake in the English. Um, I just saw it now. Um, <coughs> is a need that I think, uh, as uh, Uri asked before, what do you think will happen in the next five to ten years? I think we see a surge in the R&D of cannabis and cannabinoids, for good and for worse. Okay, we have all of this on this, the synthetic cannabinoids used, being used as drugs, what we call at least in Israel spice. I think also in the state, we see much more psychotic episodes because of those uh, synthetic cannabinoids, and they are changing. And what we call designer drugs, that should be given the culture of people using drugs, uh, but that's on the downside. On the upside, I hope we will see new cannabinoids or, or mechanisms or other ways of treating. And I believe that within the next five years, at least we'll see more of the food additives and hopefully within the 10 years period, we'll have new medications that are working either by being a cannabinoid or working within the endocannabinoid system, like if those who remember a complia that went off because of um, depression and suicide. Thank you very much. Any questions? So now I pass the... <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Baruch. As Dr. Bar Baruch has mentioned, I will switch to Czech, la Czech language, so I hope all you guys have a translation devices. Okay. Dobré dopoledne, dámy a pánové. Dopředu se omlouvám, že budu mít oproti doktoru Baruchovi a všem ostatním prezentujícím velmi nudnou přednášku, protože na mě momentálně bude předložení a osvětlení té regulace podmínek, za kterých je a bude v budoucnu možné v České republice preskribovat léčebné konopí. Ještě mi dovolte se představit, mé jméno je Jana Venslíková, vedu státní agenturu pro konopí pro léčebné použití, která je jedním z oddělení státního ústavu pro kontrolu léčiv. O čem bych chtěla v krátkosti pohovořit? Jednak bych vám ráda představila, co všechno je v rámci léčebného konopí v gesci státního ústavu pro kontrolu léčiv. Následně doufám, že zde je alespoň pár lékařů, českých lékařů, tak bych ráda představila podmínky a samozřejmě i povinnosti, které ze zákona musí dodržovat lékař, nebo měl by, respektive musí dodržovat lékař, který bude preskribovat konopí pro léčebné použití. Samozřejmě další podmínky a povinnosti máme i pro lékárníky v rámci výdeje a následně bych ráda představila, jaké informace jsme schopni poskytovat pacientům. Takže činnost státního ústavu pro kontrolu léčiv, respektive státní agentury pro konopí pro léčebné použití, se řídí zákonem 167 98 sbírky o návykových látkách. Hlavní gro činnosti státní agentury je především v udělování licencí na lokální pěstování konopí pro léčebné použití. Tato agenda je momentálně mediálně velmi propíraná, abych to řekla relativně pozitivně. Takže určitě víte, že první tender, který byl vypsán, vypsán v létě minulého roku, bohužel i přesto, že má vítěze, není možné ukončit, není ukončen, jelikož celý systém udělování licencí na lokální pěstování konopí spadá pod zákon o veřejných zakázkách, který umožňuje bohužel mnoho opravných prostředků, mnoho námitek, mnoho obstrukcí a prodlužování, takže momentálně pro vaši informaci již to včera proběhlo. V médiích máme první zakázku na úhosu, což je Ústav na ochranu hospodářské soutěže a uvidíme, jak celé šetření dopadne. Toliko k udělování licencí. Další činnost státní agentury je zajištění výkupu léčebného konopí, které je vypěstované v České republice. Na základě tendru, na základě udělené licence je vypěstováno léčebné konopí, které pokud splní všechny požadované parametry, co se týče čistoty, co se týče poměru účinných látek, co se týče dalších kvalitativních náležitostí, 
tak je vykoupeno státním ústavem pro kontrolu léčiv. Ze zákona dále státní ústav je povinen zajistit jeho distribuci do lékáren, samozřejmě pomocí i třetích osob, takže určitě nebude nikdo z nás ze státního úřadu jezdit s léčebným konopím a distribuovat ho. Samozřejmě budeme, budeme to řešit pomocí externích distributorů. Dá, další, další agenda je zajištění vývozu konopí pro léčebné použití do zahraničí. Pokud samozřejmě ještě jsme poptávku žádnou nedostali, ale je možné, že z nějaké země Evropské unie vzejde poptávka po léčebném konopí vypěstované v České republice, takže i tato agenda spadá pod státní agenturu, respektive pod státní ústav pro kontrolu léčiv. Co se týče kontroly pěstitelů, tak ze pracovníci státního ústavu pro kontrolu léčiv kontrolují soulad pěstování, respektive budou kontrolovat soulad pěstování konopí pro léčebné použití dle zásad správné pěstitelské praxe, zákona o, zákona o návykových látkách a dalších. A představení činností státního ústavu zakončím plněním veškerých informačních povinností vůči ministerstvu zdravotnictví, policii České republiky a dalším orgánům. Dovolte mi krátce pohovořit k situaci v České republice. Momentálně jsme na těchto číslech. Sice už máme rok 2015, ale stále máme dva preskribující lékaře, dvě lékárny, ve kterých je možné konopí pro léčebné použití získat. Dovolila jsem si tam optimistickou, optimistický otazník, jak to bude v roce 2015, protože upřímně doufám, že tato konference, která dle mého názoru splnila naprosto očekávání, co se týče poptávky po vzdělávání, ty prezentace, které tady zazněly, byly dle mého názoru dokonalým návodem pro české lékaře, respektive takovým odstartováním, jak dále s konopím pro léčebné použití. Jestli mohu něco ze své praxe Denně mám skutečně kolem 10-15 telefonů od pacientů, kteří se ptají, jsme vhodní pro konopnou léčbu, můžete nám poradit, kde najdeme lékaře, který nám konopím, pokud bychom byli uznáni vhodním pro tuto léčbu, může předepsat. Já jsem poměrně velmi nešťastná, že těmto pacientům musím říct, já vám v tomhle momentálně nemohu pomoci. Obraťte se na svého lékaře, bude-li se chtít vzdělávat. My jsme plně na pomocnímu pomoci se všemi dalšími kroky, které jsou potřeba pro předepisování konopí pro léčebné použití. Takže doufám, se jdeme-li se zde za rok, za dva, že to číslo u roku 2015 a 2016 bude mít, řeknu, dvě nebo tři nuly. Doufejme. Nyní bych se ráda vrátila k těm nezáživným podmínkám a povinnostem. Současná problematika předepisování léčebného konopí je upravená vyhláškou 221.2.13 sbírky, která přesně definuje, jaké, odbornosti, jaké lékařské odbornosti mohou konopí preskribovat. Jedná se o klinickou onkologii, radiační onkologii, neurologii, paliativní medicínu, léčbu bolesti, revmatologii, ortopedii, infekční lékařství, vnitřní lékařství a psychiatrii. Jak zmínil pan ministr ve středu v rámci, v rámci té uvítací, uvítacího mítingu, tato vyhláška momentálně je podrobená novelizaci. Pokud všechno bude dobře, předpokládáme v květnu, v červnu, bude platit vyhláška nová. Změny mimo jiné budou v tom, že seznam odborností, které mohou preskribovat léčebné konopí, se výrazně rozšíří. Nicméně vyhláška není ještě v platnosti, respektive novelizace vyhlášky není v platnosti, proto omluvte, prezentuji ten současný platný stav. Další důležitou podmínkou pro předepisující lékaře je nutnost disp disponováním Elektro, nutnost k dispozice elektronickým receptem. Dle zákona o návykových látkách a i dle vyhlášky je možné konopí pro léčebné použití předepsat pouze přes elektronický recept. Toliko 
jedna z nejdůležitějších podmínek. V současné době zmínila jsem, máme konopí v lékárnách pouze pro zajímavost. Toto je vyfoceno v jedné české lékárně, která má naskladněno konopí pro léčebné použití, které momentálně je možné dovést pouze z Holandska. Tudíž to, co dostane český pacient v lékárně, je toto konopí těsně. Toto je foceno těsně před rozplněním, kdy jeden pacient měl předpis na jeden gram, tudíž lékárník musel rozvážit z té desetigramové nebo pětigramové lékovky jeden gram. Tak, jak jsem zmínila, nutnost elektronického receptu je první, nikoli jedinou povinností pro, předpis, pro možnost předepisování konopí pro léčebné použití. Vzhledem k tomu, že předpis konopí je vázáno na určité diagnózy, který, na určité specializace, pardon, je nutné ověřit specializaci předepisujícího lékaře. Tudíž pro získání přístupů do registru léčivých přípravků s omezením musí lékař vyplnit formulář, který je dostupný na stránkách státní agentury www.sakl.cz a doložit odbornou specializaci, že disponuje specializací jednou z těch, které jsou uvedeny ve vyhlášce 221. Já si uvědomuji, že pro mnohé lékaře se tato tato obstrukce může zdát velmi složitá, proto dopředu říkám, pokud budete mít problém, zavolejte nám, my jsme schopni vám samozřejmě s tím pomoci, stejně jako jsme pomohli těm dvou lékařkám, které nám, které nám momentálně preskribují. Co se týče předpisů upravujících, výdej konopí pro léčebné použití. Já se dopředu omlouvám, nejsem lékárník, ale mám zde erudované kolegy ze státního ústavu, takže pokud by byly nějaké dotazy ze strany farmaceutů, předám mikrofon. Ale nicméně, výdej konopí pro léčebné použití může vydat pouze lékárna, která rovněž stejně jako lékař disponuje elektronickým receptem. Pro vaši informaci, v České republice máme zhruba 2,5 tisíce lékáren, elektronickým receptem disponuje zhruba 1689, přibývá to každý den. Takže samozřejmě určitě lze najít lékárnu, která bude schopna vydat elektronický, která disponuje elektronickým receptem a bude schopna vydat konopí pro léčebné použití. Dále cituji pouze, pouze zákony, což s tím nechci tady Unavovat lékárna vede stejnou evidenci pro konopí jako pro jakoukoliv jinou léčivou látku a navíc samozřejmě jako pro látku návykovou, například jako pro morfin a to je k těm formalitám, co se týče výdeje, asi, asi všechno. Tak samozřejmě v rámci státní agentury se snažíme informovat pacienty, Záměrně jsem použila snažíme, protože samozřejmě informace, které máme, jsou pouze zprostředkované. Nemáme české pacienty, nemáme zpětnou vazbu od českých pacientů. Velmi úzce spolupracujeme s pacientskou organizací COPAC, s kterou tímto děkuju paní Wagnerové, jelikož samozřejmě pro nás pacienti jsou samozřejmě velmi důležití a jakákoliv zpětná vazba, kterou my od nich můžeme dostat, následně můžeme dát na webové stránky a pomoci tím, všeobecné informovanosti. Zde mi jen dovolte krátký screen ze stránek agentury. Kdyby jsme tady byli na internetu, mohla bych vám představit ten web kompletně, ale nebudu, ho, nebudu to komplikovat. www.sakl.cz Zde je možné najít informace, jak pro potenciální pěstitele, jaká pravidla se dodržují, jak funguje výběrové řízení, co všechno je potřeba k žádosti o účast při výběrovém řízení, informace pro distributory a dovozce. Nezmínila jsem v současné době dovážené konopí, které je přes klasickou distribuci, není v gesci státní agentury. Pokud se distributor rozhodne, že chce dovážet konopí pro léčebné použití, 
musí zažádat o povolení ministerstvo zdravotnictví, respektive inspektorát o mamných a psychotropních látek a může v podstatě začít, začít konopí do České republiky dovážet. Máme zde informace pro lékaře, jakým způsobem se přihlásit do registru léčivých přípravků s omezením, jaké odbornosti mohou preskribovat, co mohou předepisovat, jak informovat pacienty. Samozřejmě nechcem, nemůžeme si dovolit suplovat to medicínské gro, takže ty informace pro lékaře jsou velmi velmi obšírné, bližší informace by měly poskytovat samozřejmě odborné společnosti. Informace pro lékárníky, jakými pravidly se řídí výdej konopí pro léčebné použití a samozřejmě už mnou zmiňované informace pro pacienty, kde v zkratce představujeme, co je teda konopí pro léčebné použití, jaké druhy jsou momentálně dle vyhlášky možné předepsat, upozornění a omezení, způsob použití, i přesto, že je výhradně na lékaři. Momentálně dle vyhlášky máme pouze možnost dvou použití léčebného konopí, a to je inhalace a vnitřní užití. Nežádoucí účinky, zjistila jsem, že máme na webu stejné nežádoucí účinky, jako před chvilkou zmínil doktor Baruch, takže za to jsem vděčná a doporučení a uchovávání, jakým způsobem skladovat konopí pro léčebné použití. V rámci domovské stránky SAKLU jsou samozřejmě i kontakty, kde lze získat kontakt na mě i na kolegy, takže pokud můžeme být čímkoliv nápomocni, jak zdravotnickým profesionálům, lékárníkům či pacientům, určitě se neváhejte na nás obrátit. A já vám tímto děkuji za pozornost a předávám mikrofon Would you like to continue? Thank you very much. I think we covered all, our, all our, what we designed to cover. So any questions? And if not, you will adjourn for lunch. Sorry. Okay, first of all. Okay. Um, Henry Kleber again from Germany. I hope uh, you're not waiting too much for lunch now because I have now the question. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, just my question because uh, I think now you have um, showed two different kind of systems. One in Israel where is an um, individual license-based um, system, as I get it right, and um, in the Czech Republic uh, system where it's, I say, only the prescription of the physician is mandatory for the medical cannabis. So in Germany, I'm from the regulatory bodies in Germany. Uh, we have more like in Israel, and, uh, it's a license-based system, uh, but not that much uh, patients like in Israel yet, let me say. Okay, the question is, let me come to the point. Um, is there a specific reason now in Israel, maybe the question to Mr. Baruch, uh, why it's a license-based system and not only the decision of the um, um, physician is enough or, uh, yeah, um, for, for, for the appliance for medical purposes. And yeah, why, why the Czech Republic uh, choose maybe another system not to go one more step. You also talked about the bureaucracy to the step to the competent authority and back. As far as I, as I know and as far as I believe the Czech system is much better than the Israeli in that respect. I, ho I, uh, I also hope that they learn from our mistakes. <laughs> in Israel, the license is needed to, actually due to uh, bureaucratic reasons of the law. When we implemented the uh, system in 1992, we have a specific law concerning drug abuse. And there it said that drug uh, can be Uh, grown, used, manufactured in Israel only by a specific permit from the Director General of the Ministry of Health or someone uh, that he allows to, uh, which was me for 10 years. That's the reason why they, in Israel they need a permit. We think it's a, it's a bureaucratic reason that should not, uh, that is, how do you say, mutar, uh, you can put it aside. Sorry, I don't remember the, the, word, the specific word. We believe that the Czech system is much more efficient and it still allows uh, the big brother, shall we say, to get 
scan every prescription and to see if one of the doctors is going above the limit or has too many patients and at least call him to for explanation and don't, mean, and don't think he should be punished or anything. At least ask him, maybe, we will, maybe as the regulators we will learn something new. And the only sanction that as far as I know will be allowed is to take him actually out of the uh, computerized system so he will, not, he will not be able to write any uh, more uh, prescriptions. And still, you see the, the ministry, as, as I said, all the prescription knows exactly how much total amount of cannabis is being used in the country, at least, again, legitimately, and can, can say that to the UN, because as we saw in one of the presentations, uh, the UN does not have enough knowledge of exactly how much use of cannabis is being done in the various countries, and can also decide on its whether they want, they want the specific strains and so. So I think actually the Czech Republic in this domain is much more better than ours. You know, as, as, as you have mentioned, we are at the beginning, and you saw in my presentation we have present time two doctors and two pharmacists. So I hope that our system will work, but we will see. <laughs> In order for a system to work, uh, the, in order for a system to work, what's mandatory, at least in the beginning, is going from place to place to educate doctors. In the beginning, and I think Dr. Resnick is here, and I saw Professor Kremer also uh, would oblige that we went from hospital to hospital and gave lectures sometimes to only wards, sometimes to the whole hospital. We went to various clinics in the sick funds, and for the first four to five years, we were just going around the country explaining. As I said, for the first three years, we had to explain how dare, how dare we ask the, pay, the doctors to prescribe cannabis. Then the, the movie came up, uh, uh, grass prescription, and uh, by now we have to convince some of the doctors that I say, as I said before, that it's not a miracle drug, which for me is a step, step forward. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, official law is very similar to, to the Israeli one. From where, where are you? I'm from Prague, Czech Republic. My name is Richard Rukita. But, you know, the problem is that officially this is the same, same uh, limitation as you have. But everybody is trying how to escape from it. One is the uh, one is the possibility which was done by the Czech uh, Chamber of, me of Medical Doctors, but it's not, the, it's not the law, it's only the recommendation. And we, our, our society for the, for the, for the pain, uh, uh, prepared one possibility about the control, but it is very, very complicated and it was not of officially accepted. So. At the beginning, if you have only two, two medical doctors, it's no problem. But after all, it will be the problem. If something will happen, every, in every case, the medical doctor is responsible up to now. So it is necessary to find how to escape this official law, which was the law done by the Czech uh, Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Dr. Wesnick? Thank you, Dr. Baruch, for providing uh, very important information. And from the position of the independent physician and the coordinator of Israel uh, Forum for Medicinal Cannabis, I would like to say that wh while to welcome you to be criticism, to provide some criticism for policy of Ministry of Health toward the licensing the patients, because you know uh, for the uh, last period of time, for the five years ago, uh, until now, the majority of the supplied uh, uh, applications signed by the doctors, Israeli doctors, were, were rejected. Until now, they are rejecting the majority of the applications signed by, not by the patients and their relatives, by, supported by the doctors and submitted to, to uh, our medicinal cannabis authority, are rejected. Till now, without any obvious reasons. So our system is obvious, not efficient, and uh, I suppose it should be changed. And I, very welcome you that uh, you provide some kind of criticism to this functioning. And I hope that in Czech Republic, they, you will learn from our 
uh, good lessons and bad lessons and will make your own mistake, but I hope that you will learn from all experience. For my, our, the position of our association, International Association of Cannabinoid Medicine, that the best system is what the less regulation. We are not going to say that we, uh, we encourage the position, uh, uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, so-called poor doctors, you know, but we, we are so far from it, so we should encourage, as you mentioned, to uh, encourage any kind of doctor and healthcare professionals education in order to reduce these unwanted events. So my, and my, uh, my suggestion to Jana, uh, when the pay, you, you receive the uh, telephone call from, uh, from patients, just refer them to the intermediate person, to patients association, to say, please ask them, they should not to say, go to your first physician, because you are sending them to people mostly unwanted to do with this. So uh, this kind of the answer, just not helpful for the patient. Please reflect them to your website, to your uh, patient association. They will find probably some kind of cannabis friendly doctors or doctors that who have uh, some kind of experience and education in this mean. It will be uh, much more helpful for such patients. Thank you. I would like to say that, of course, I was asked a lot of times that would I, from how do you say, a backwards point of view or retrograde point of view, would I have, would I have done things differently? The answer is, of course, but uh, uh, wisdom, retrograde wisdom is usually the best wisdom. The point is when implementing something in another country, you should learn from the mistakes of those who are there already, Israel, Netherlands, now the Czech Republic. I'm happy to say that at least according to my belief, the Czech Republic uh, system is better than ours. I'm sure they will encounter their own problems. <laughs> and probably when we change ours, we'll learn from them the new problems and how to circumvent them or to treat. That's progress. The, I, was, I was taught at the beginning of my uh, residency in, um, in medical um, health resource that the enemy of better is the best. Usually you want to do everything better, so you wait and you don't do nothing. Eventually, you want to implement something, there is a cost. I'm sorry. <laughs> Any more questions? Já mám český dotaz na paní magistru Vencíkovou. Je známo, kolik předpisů, tedy elektronickou formou, bylo za rok 2014 použito a jaké množství přípravku, teda firmy Bedokran, se za tu dobu, tedy za uplynulý rok, vydalo? Tak, co se týče elektronických receptů jako takových, tak vám to nemohu říci, protože elektronická preskripce probíhá nejen na léčebné konopí. Takže tolik k elektronickým receptům, ale samozřejmě, co mám informace od lékařek, respektive z lékárny, kde se léčebné konopí vydává, nikoli za minulý rok, ale registr byl spuštěn v říjnu a máme vydáno 10 receptů. Takže za říjen, listopad, prosinec, leden. Množství vám neřeknu, nicméně lékařky, vzhledem k tomu, že ta zkušenost není zatím velká, tak začaly předepisovat opravdu po malých dávkách. Takže jsme v řádech gramů, respektive desítek gramů. Tak, ale deset receptů v rámci v řádu deseti gramů. Dobrý den, nebudu mít taky český dotaz na paní magistru Venslíkovou. Paní magistro, já se chci jenom zeptat, já složil ten elektronický, elektronický recept za velkou obstrukci. Co nás vede k tomu v Českou republiku, že potřebujeme zrovna na kanabis elektronický recept a předepisuju obrovské množství opidu jako lékař léčby bolesti. Tam stačí v podstatě klasický modrý opiatový recept a tady ke kanabisu který teoreticky by měl být dosažitelnější, nebo chceme bojovat za to, aby byl dosažitelnější, tak máme velkou obstrukci v tom elektronickém receptu. Děkuji, děkuji za ten dotaz. Nicméně já, mě nepřísluší obhajoba zákonů, abych pravdu řekla. To, že léčebné konopí musí být přes elektronický recept, je zákonná povinnost. Takže z mé strany pouze, jak tomuto vyhovět. Co se týče smyslu e, zřízení registru léčivých přípravků s omezením, ten je v podstatě dvojí. 
hlídání povolené měsíční dávky, která momentálně je 30 gramů v rámci nové vyhlášky, určitě jste informováni, že se bude navyšovat a spolupráce, respektive kontrola ze strany policie České republiky. Pokud má pacient elektronicky předepsáno konopí, pro příklad je zkontrolována ulici příslušníkem policie, může se prokázat přes přístup policie do registru, že ano, je to pacient, má předepsáno léčebné konopí a následně samozřejmě není, není nějak perzekuován. Ale jak jsem již uvedla, nemohu obhajovat, proč je konopí přes elektronický recept, protože my pouze naplňujeme teda zákonnou povinnost. Určitě ne. Spíš naopak těch přípravků, které budou povinně přes elektronický recept, bude daleko víc. But I want to say something in, uh, in favorable of electronics uh, prescription. As I said, uh, the state, according to the UN Convention, has to decide and foresee how much cannabis should be grown in the country for medical reasons in the foreseeing future. If I don't have a database which is made out of the electronic prescription, I don't know how much I need, I don't know the growth rate, and then I cannot foresee and tell the growers how much to grow. And if they will grow too much, they will have to uh, destroy the access. And then the cost of the cannabis for the patient would, of course, go up because they not only had to grow an access, they had to destroy it, which is also costly. Okay, so that's, a, from my point of view, a reason for an electronic uh, prescription that has no connection with the law. Any more questions? Um, you and then... I would like to ask you if you experienced or encountered in your practice um, any complaints from patients who, um, who are on long-term therapy with uh, cannabis um, regarding uh, developed addiction? Any complaints in your practice? There were, there were a few. I think I treated about already about 200 patients totally. Not all of them are in my care, as I said. Uh, at least three of them, we believe, or I believe, that uh, had addiction. It's less than the 9% that we were supposed to see. Uh, and and uh, eventually, we stopped cannabis with all three. <laughs> what do you mean they comply? Depends what you're calling compliance. We gave them a 30-gram allowance. We went up to 60-gram allowance for a month, and they finished it within one week. <laughs> Is it a compliance or not? <laughs> Uh, they, were, they were happy at the beginning when I, when I prescribed cannabis. They were much less happy when I stopped it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry if, that I, if I understood your answer. I know that they complain like, um, in like go to the court or anything like this. Uh, uh, yes. We had um, a, few, um, a few people went to the high court. Uh, in Israel it's called bagats. I have the, I don't know, the honorable or the unhonorable title of being the most uh, high court, of, having, of being the doctor with the most high, uh, high, um, uh, high court complaints. We had about 12 of them. All of them were rejected by the high court. Okay. Děkuji, já se omluvám. Moudrá Venčová, Česká republika. Internistka, já se omlouvám, že trošičku odbočuju od hlavního tématu, ale já bych spíš podpořila to, aby elektronický recept byl rozšířený opravdu na všechny léky, aby, aby byly sníženy obstrukce, které jsou s vydáním toho elektronického receptu, protože u nás v republice probíhá redistribuce léků a dokud tohle nebude udělané, nikdy nebudeme mít přehled, kolik léků se u nás opravdu doopravdy vydává a kdo je, kdo je rozděluje. Děkuji. Though it's not a question, I know that at least in Israel, the, the, far, the uh, main, uh, how do you say, the, the, the farm pharmacies in Israel also believe that we should turn to electronic prescriptions. In most of the sick funds now, all prescriptions are electronic. It's actually easier for the patient because if you want to have an allocation of a, of a chronic prescription, like I said, uh, every three months, you don't have to see the doctor. You can call the doctor. He opens the EMR, the electronic medical records, decide that it's sufficient and then puts on electronic prescription and you don't have to have the prescription like we used to have by hand, you just go to the pharmacy and it's already there on the computer. So it's much more easier for the patients also. 
Yeah, and at the same time, it's a control for the patient. Uh, wo uh, what was described on his name by, by uh, some doctor? Yeah, it's uh, transparent from and, and both it's sides. Actually, it's much easier than that when I go f now and I want the history of a patient to see exactly, even when I talked, that we want to see that he, at least he was given uh, uh, the normal treatment or the required treatment for his diagnosis before starting cannabis. When it's on electronic records like in Israel, I can get it with a pressing a button to see all his history and, and to see what, not only what was prescribed for him, but at least what he bought in the pharmacy. Whether he took it or not, it's completely another story. Já jsem farmaceut, takže si dovolím vám odpovědět. Um, prosím vás, paní kolegyně, rozhodně elektronický recept nevyřeší reexporty léků v České republice. Dneska všechny lékárny, téměř všechny, na pár třeba výjimečných stovek, podávají hlášení o vydaných lécích, které se odesílají na sůkl. Takže tady v tomto jako nějakou výhodu nehledejte, spíš to bude skutečně kontrola té preskripce a toho, co užíváte a využít to ve prospěch těch zdravotnických informací pro vás. Největší reexportéři léků jsou především distributoři léků. To už se dneska všeobecně ví, ale vzhledem k volnému pohybu zboží v Evropské unii je to velkým problémem, ale pokud já mám informace, tak Státní ústav pro kontrolu léčiv spolu s ministerstvem zdravotnictví pracují na nějakém způsobu, který by tady tuto situaci nepříznivou pro pacienty, která nám samozřejmě všem velmi vadí, takže ji nějakým způsobem uspokojivě vyřeší. Děkuji. We, we have... We have time for just two more questions because I was asked to be on time because they have to uh, divide the court into three different courts for the afternoon session. Uh, I'm going. Thank you. I'd like to ask Professor Baruch. Uh, I'm a geriatrician from Czech Republic and I would like to ask if uh, the incidence of the de novo uh, schizophrenia or psychotic episodes is more frequent in patients with pre-existing dementia when administered cannabinoids. Um, Thank you. No, with pre-existing dementia we did not see any more uh, schizophrenic. We are now exactly publishing actually a very small amount of 15 patients who were treated because of violent behavior in dementia, mainly Alzheimer, with cannabis within the hospital settings in our psychology, in my former hospital psychogeriatric ward. I'm not still used to be, say my former hospital. I'm sorry. Um, and it will be uh, presented in Denmark when there's a, on violent behavior in, in uh, psychiatric in, in September. Um, we do see, or at least we suspect that in Parkinson patients, usually also old age, uh, we see more psychosis in cannabis use, especially when it's used with dopica or other dopamine derivatives to treat the Parkinson. But that's obvious part of the problem of treating Parkinson's that you might get psychosis or hallucinations uh, due to treatment. Any more questions? Thank you very much for your time and we will come back after lunch.